Hi, my name is Claire McCarthy. I'm a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital and medical communications editor. I'm here with Dr. Kitty O'Hare, who is both a pediatrician and an internist, mm -hmm. um, and is also the director of transition medicine uh, for primary care at Boston Children's Hospital. Yes. And we're here to talk about your recent review article in um, Current Opinion of Pediatrics. Please, can you tell me a little bit about it and what you were hoping to do with this article? I wrote the article with two collaborators from the Division of Adolescent Medicine and what we wanted to do was to pull together uh, practical tools, helpful hints for pediatricians who are trying to help their young adults prepare for moving on to the adult world, for getting out of pediatrics, which is really where um, we see most of our patients going. You know, this is this is really great. I know that as a pediatrician, I have a lot of patients who are getting older and you kind of, you get to that point and they're 18, 19, 20 and you find yourself just sort of saying, well, bye, <laughs> as opposed to really helping them. Um, but I know for me, helping can be a challenge. Can you talk a little bit about some of the tools that you talk about in the article because they were great. Sure. And there's actually an official definition of uh, transition care, which is providing purposeful planned movement from pediatric to adult care. And the emphasis here is on the purposeful and the planned. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that the process of transitioning from pediatrics to adult care is not going to be just the, oh, by the way, this is your last visit, see ya, but that it is a process and it takes place over a number of years. In the article you talked about starting between 11 and 13. Yep. And that's consistent with what's um, recommended by national groups. We uh, wrote our article using uh, the outline of the six core elements of healthcare transition, um, which comes from a maternal child health bureau program called GOT Transition, which is really kind of looked at what are the best practices out there right now for facilitating transition care. And step number one is starting early, uh, starting at 11 to 13, not to tell patients per se, you know, we're ready to kick you out the door, but that um, there is a future ahead of you and uh, adult care is in your future. And to get there, there are some things that we need to accomplish, including helping you know more about your own health and learning how to take care of yourself. One of the practical ways that a practice can do this actually is um, by developing a transition policy. It's really helpful for practices to specifically state um, how they treat adolescents when they start thinking about um, treating adolescents as their own person, getting them involved in their care, and then also kind of the, the target date for when they'd be moving on to adult care. That way there's no surprises. Parents, uh, kids are all on the same page. So it's not just about we won't see you past this age, but also things like starting at around this age, saying to the parents, we may ask you to leave the room. Exactly. In the article you also talk about some concrete things that I think would be good to talk about for our, our audience. Things like a registry or things like a, a, the packet you talked about, transition packets and health care summaries. Can you talk briefly about some of those things? There's varying degrees of sophistication with all of this. I have known some practices to have very sophisticated um, databases that they can um, extract, you know, how many of their patients have Down syndrome and, uh, and how many uh, what is their score on the latest transition planning tool. It can be as simple as for a registry having an Excel spreadsheet of, okay, these are the 10 patients that we know are going to require the most help moving on to adult care, and we've just decided we're going to focus our efforts on these patients over time. And very often these patients would be, as you say, the patients with special health care needs. Yes, uh, which brings up a good point. All youth need to transition. The, what we talked about in the article really applies to all youth, mm -hmm. but it's especially important to think about the transition process as well as the actual transfer of care for uh, youth and children with special health care needs. As a pediatrician, I think it, I know who to refer to within my within my peers, with the pediatricians, and which pediatric cardiologists, which pediatric orthopedists, but I find when I have some of my patients with special health care needs and they become adults, it's kind of like hitting a wall, like I don't know the people on the other side of the wall. Yes. What advice can you give to pediatricians like me? I advise pediatricians to drill, drill a hole through the wall and put in a window <laughs> to see <laughs> to the other side. I, you know, it's funny, as, as someone who works on both sides of the wall, having one foot in pediatrics and one foot in adult care, I see that people on both sides are scared of each other and really don't know each other and have a chance to communicate. 
So I encourage pediatricians to develop referral networks for adult providers, just as they would with specialists in pediatrics. Um, a practical way to do this, one starting point might be going to your state medical society, like the Mass Medical Society, and saying, hey, could, do you happen to know what are the practices in my area that are taking new patients? Um, going to a, a regional medical society meeting and getting to know some of them. And it's building relationships. You're building mm -hmm. relationships over time. It's not done in a day. But if you do this over a course of years, you're going to have a referral database. And we know that uh, internists will be thrilled to take more complex patients if the pediatricians are preparing them. One of the biggest complaints I hear from my fellow internists is that they get these patients with piles of records that come in a box and the patient can't explain what's wrong with them and the, the families are very uh, and sometimes used to what's been done with the pediatrician and not as used to how things might run in internal medicine and it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. But I think if um, pediatricians are preparing patients, preparing families, even in the most complex cases and the internist can see like, wow, this pediatrician colleague um, is really doing a good job and I feel very comfortable from the start um, taking care of this patient, they'll be more willing to take on more. I imagine another benefit of having a window in the wall would be that there could be some communication between the two, uh, between the people on either side. So the internist perhaps could ask questions of the pediatrician, the pediatrician could be in contact with the family. Is that something you would suggest? Absolutely. The communication does go both ways. I encourage pediatricians to uh, make themselves available to the internist when they need help. You know, a lot of the conditions that we treat in pediatrics are fairly uncommon um, in the adult world. And it may be that the internist just might have some questions about a particular condition. And um, as time goes by, as they get more comfortable in management, then they'll be ready to go on their own. I also, by the way, encourage pediatricians to periodically follow up with families to find out how their experience went and communicate with the family. So we're adding in a third communication. Mm -hmm. Make sure that uh, their experience of landing in internal medicine went well, that they're satisfied with the provider, they're satisfied with the process, most importantly, and what suggestions would they have for improving the process for other families. Is there a website or a particular resource that you can point pediatricians to where they could find some of these materials and links to some of these things that you've been talking about? Absolutely. Uh, in our tables, in the articles, we did put in a lot of websites. Um, everything is kind of freely available. I'd say the central clearinghouse is the GOT Transition website, www.gottransition.org, um, which lays out the six steps to achieving healthcare transitions, has tons of links to outside resources, um, lots of tools, everything from sample transition policies to sample registries to how to write a care plan with a patient. That sounds great. Sounds perfect. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly helpful. A pleasure talking to you.